Random encounters have been part of Final Fantasy's DNA for decades, and even though their usage has diminished over the years in favour of enemies appearing in the overworld, you can still see their influence on the series even today. Not meant to halt one's progression outright, random encounters served as a way to drain a player's resources, forcing them to use up their curatives and MP and make the risk of journeying across the world map or spelunking deep into a dungeon feel much more real. Every once in a while though, the player was bound to run into a random encounter that was a little bit more difficult than the usual rank and file enemies, whether this was because they had wandered into a late game area early or just gotten extremely unlucky. These fights often represented huge momentary difficulty spikes and had players hoping they had saved their progress recently. In this regard, Final Fantasy has definitely featured a host of devilish monsters fans discuss in hushed tones. In fact, we've even highlighted some of these before in our previous video on the topic. But as there's always more to be said, today we'd like to shine a light on a few more of these encounters. As usual, we'll be focusing on one random encounter per game, so with that caveat out of the way, let's jump right in. So these are 7 more of the hardest random encounters that made you regret not saving your game, and let's kick things off with a perplexingly powerful pack of pugilists, the horrible 11 monk configuration from Final Fantasy Tactics. Final Fantasy Tactics has become notorious amongst fans of the series for featuring some of the most difficult and unforgiving battles. Given the length of time encounters took to complete in the game, losing after a protracted fight could mean a loss of quite a bit of time and progress. The fight against Vygraf and the deep dungeon levels are often brought up in this context, but Final Fantasy Tactics had even more challenges lying in wait for players unlucky enough to stumble upon them, the rare battles. These rare battles were random encounters that had a low chance of triggering on certain areas of the map, and one of the most infamous and challenging of these was the Grog's Hill battle against 11 monks. If this fight was simply a struggle against overwhelming numbers, that would be one thing, but what truly made this battle a nightmare was the monk's skill set. Offensively speaking, the monks had a lot in their arsenal. They could attack from a distance with Wave Fist, for instance, and if the player was unfortunate enough to have their characters all lined up, they were at risk of being hit by Earth Slash, which was capable of hitting multiple characters at the same time. Their repeating fist attack could hit a single character multiple times for massive damage at close range, and to top it all off, their regular unarmed strikes were nothing to sneeze at. Defensively was probably where the real frustration from this fight stemmed from though. This was because, between their chakra and revive abilities, the monks were capable of healing and restoring fallen members of their party to the battlefield, which made making any progress against them very difficult. Also, they could come equipped with some key passive abilities like counter and HP restore, truly making this fight a war of attrition. Seeing this many enemies appear at once at the start of any encounter, in addition to them all being the same job, would surely be a shock to many players. And as the random battles would increase in difficulty in tactics as the player leveled up their party, this fight could end up being almost completely unwinnable with the wrong party setup or lack of preparation. And at that point, all you could do was just hope that it hadn't been too long since you last saved. As with most JRPGs, the majority of challenging enemies presented by the developers of a Final Fantasy game can be overcome should the player level up enough or acquire more powerful equipment or abilities. Sometimes, though, a challenge can present itself at a point in the game's narrative where the player's options are limited, turning what might be a fairly standard late game encounter into an early game nightmare, like with Final Fantasy IX's Garuda. After leaving Limblum and acquiring Freya as a party member, the player could find themselves travelling through Gizemaluk's Grotto on their way to Burmesia, a path which itself was fraught with danger. But if they wanted to pick up the optional White Wind Blue Magic ability for Queena, they could instead opt to take an optional exit near the end of the dungeon. This exit led to Popo's Heights, a part of the world map in which the Garuda monster, who possessed the aforementioned ability, could be found. This, however, was no simple task. At that point in the main scenario, the Garuda was by far the strongest monster the player could encounter, outclassing all previously encountered bosses and even some still to come. Using its Maelstrom ability, it could reduce a character's HP to a single digit, even through Reflect, leaving them open to being picked off by Aerial Slash, an ability which targeted all characters. 
Garuda could also cast powerful fire magic, which could either hit the whole party or a single target for huge damage. But what really made things difficult was its ability to inflict the stop status and render a player's efforts to defend themselves completely useless. While the passive ability, Locomotion, could nullify this specific threat, obtaining it that early in the game was an extreme effort in and of itself and required quite a lot of grinding to pull off. White Wind was, of course, an extremely useful ability to have early access to, but it's debatable whether or not the effort required to obtain it from the Garuda was worth it, especially when you could just get it later on. If by chance though the player happens to accidentally run into Garuda at Popo's Heights while exploring Gizemlik's Grotto, as opposed to purposely preparing for it and seeking it out, we hope they were diligent enough to save their game, as it would likely be a guaranteed game over. When Final Fantasy XV released, it continued the tradition established by Final Fantasy XII of having enemies appear on the world map instead of entering into specific instances of random encounters like the older games. That being said, Final Fantasy XV did have something akin to its own take on random battles, as when travelling at night, demons could attack the player, rising up from pools of dark magic in the ground, and the player would have little recourse but to stand and fight, or flee. The monsters that attacked the party at night were always a threat to Noctis and the party's safety, but none were as dangerous as the fearsome Red Giants, who had a chance of appearing either on their own or after an Iron Giant was felled. These towering creatures were powered up versions of Iron Giants, complete with massive flaming swords. While they only attacked with physical attacks, their sword swipes were imbued with the fire element, and they could make use of gravity magic to draw the player close to them, making it even easier to end up a victim of their assault. The Red Giants could also pick Noctis up in their fist and deal continuous damage over time as long as he was held captive, a manoeuvre almost as annoying as the fact they took half damage from all magic and weapon types save for the Royal Arms. As the player drew near to the end of the game and increased their stock of Royal Arms, defeating these foes would become much more realistic, but the threat they posed to Noctis and the party throughout the majority of the game was very real. Effectively, they served as the ultimate deterrence for travelling throughout Aeos at night, and if encountered, they would often leave the player with no choice but to hightail it out of there as quickly as they could. In the history of the franchise there have been very few enemies that have appeared in nearly every title, becoming a crucial part of what makes a Final Fantasy game a Final Fantasy game. Most of these enemies, like Tombreys or Cactors, often pose a significant threat to the player's adventure, but came in unassuming packages. The formidable Behemoth, however, delivered pretty much what was promised on the tin, and the Final Fantasy IV iteration of the enemy, which was the first seen by Western players, was especially nasty. Located on the moon, the Behemoth was most likely first encountered by the player as a fixed battle in the Lair of the Father on the way to acquiring Bahamut. After that, they could be found in the Lunar Subterrain as random encounters, sometimes even appearing as groups of two. In battle, the Behemoth was a formidable sight to behold and was more akin to a mini-boss than a regular enemy. To begin, it had a very high magic defensive stat, meaning magic had little effect on it. Not only that, casting any black or white magic on the Behemoth would cause it to counter with Storm, an ability that would target the entire party and deal massive damage. If you then decided to take advantage of its low defensive stat, you would be met with another counterattack, this time physical in nature. This would see the Behemoth deal an extremely powerful single attack against the character who attacked it, making each strike against it quite costly. Now, as the Behemoth wouldn't attack the player on its own, the only way to get past this wall of defense was to either cast Blink on your characters to avoid physical damage, or to use Ridius Summons, as these would not result in a magical counter. With careful planning and some strategy, most endgame parties would have no trouble dealing with this enemy, and could net themselves a considerable experience boost in the process. But what made this encounter so difficult was how punishing it would be for players who were too aggressive or thinking they could just brute force their way through the fight, effectively turning bravado into a death sentence and likely leading to many rage quits. Random encounters featuring a pack of enemies of any variety can often bring out a moment of pause, and wondering if the battle is worth the risk of loss of progress or even just the spent resources like MP and valuable curatives is a common reaction. Sometimes though, you don't get the chance to flee or fight back, especially when ambushed. And in those instances, all you can do is watch a group of enemies mercilessly inflict status elements on your party, rendering them useless. Within Final Fantasy II, 
One of the worst instances of this was a pack of land rays in the Palamecium Desert. The land ray is an interesting fit for this list because, as a monster, it's actually quite unremarkable. It has mediocre stats, and despite being a generally hardy creature for once encountered, it has no item drops or special ability to speak of. That being said, it does have one standout feature. It seems to be unnaturally adept at paralysing the player's party and leaving them absolutely stunlocked. In a nutshell, that's basically what makes the Landry an enemy to be feared. Until you absolutely had to cross the Palamecian Desert in Final Fantasy II, it was recommended to avoid this region at all costs, as all it would take would be a couple of lucky attacks from a Landray to completely decimate an unprepared party. Coming back later on, once leveled, the land rays posed much less of a challenge, but that lingering threat of paralysis would continue to loom large, so dispatching them as quickly as possible, or avoiding them altogether, was the recommended course of action. Now, large foreboding foes are mainstays in the bestiary of every Final Fantasy game, with the likes of dragons, undersea horrors, and even alien lifeforms all appearing in battle from time to time. Often overlooked, however, are the cuter, smaller enemies that serve as low-level stepping stones at the outset of an adventure. These are often just cannon fodder, but every now and again, Square liked to remind players not to judge a book by its cover. And one of the best examples is Final Fantasy V's Skull Eater. Appearing alongside its much weaker cousin, the Nutkin, one could be forgiven at first for underestimating the strength of the Skull Eater. For starters, this enemy had extremely high evasion and defense, especially for when the players could first encounter them, and it meant that weaker spells and attacks would often miss or do no damage as a result, handy considering the Skull Eater only had 1 HP. But no defense is worth its salt without a strong offense, and the Skull Eater also had this in spades. Boasting an unusually high attack stat, this little rodent was capable of quickly and reliably one-shotting unprepared lower level party members, easily dealing over 1,500 points of damage per attack. To make matters even worse, if hit by magic, the Skull Eater would then create copies of itself, further multiplying the terror. Returning to the cave later on with a reliable set of skills would allow the player to farm the Skull Eater for AP but nothing quite lived up to that initial shock of the first accidental encounter against a Skull Eater. And this would of course be amplified because the Skull Eater would appear randomly alongside much weaker enemies, giving the player a false sense of security. While all the preceding encounters on this list made you regret not saving for a myriad of reasons, for our final entry today, we had to go for the one and only Great Marlborough from Final Fantasy X. We covered Marlboros in our last video on the hardest random encounters, opting to focus on the Final Fantasy VIII variant. But the Great Marlborough, found in the Omega Ruins and inside Sin, is simply on a different level. A monster with a limited skill set and only moderately hardy stats would normally not be a problem in a playthrough of a Final Fantasy game. But the Great Marlborough had one key feature that made it stand out. It began each and every encounter with an ambush attack. Ambush attacks had a chance of occurring in almost every random encounter in Final Fantasy X, giving monsters a first turn and effectively letting them get some free damage in, putting the player's party on the back foot. The ability First Strike could ensure that a player always got the first move, but amongst the best weapons in the game, the Celestial Weapons, only Orange Masamune had this ability, meaning even endgame setups were at risk of the Great Marlborough's first attack. And what other attack? Could that first assault be other than the Marlborough's signature ability, Bad Breath? Bad Breath had an almost guaranteed chance to inflict silence, darkness and poison, in addition to also being able to cause confusion, berserk and slow. This, if left unmitigated by accessories or first strike, could tear parties apart while all the player could do was watch the Marlborough pick off their party with its gastric juice, full auto and munch attacks. To make matters even worse, the Marlborough could proceed to use bad breath one third of the time, meaning you were never truly safe from being drowned by nasty statuses, even if you scrambled to remove them with a sooner or items. It meant the Great Marlborough, as a more powerful version of the already iconically difficult Final Fantasy monster, was effectively a one-trick pony, except with two tricks, 
but one of them definitely had us regretting not doing a courtesy save on our way into the Omega Ruins. And with that, I think we're done. These were seven of the hardest random encounters that made you regret not saving, but we know there's a few we probably didn't include, so be sure to let us know in the comments below which random encounters had you second guessing whether you saved your game recently, and if you enjoyed this video, please give us a like and be sure to subscribe to the channel. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, Chris M. Walker, The Livestream, Elsa Claire Farron, Galson Dikujata, Gregory, Justin Dent, Lord of Morning, and Zukan TDK, who are super special Onionite supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.